Welcome to Heartbreak and Hope with Pat Barbarito, the show that explores how to build up or break down any relationship with confidence, clarity, and compassion. Normally, I would start out an episode with talking about my guest and going over their credentials, singing their praises as to the formality of their training. But today, well, we're going to approach it a little differently. Now, with me is Dr. Michael Libertazzo. Dr. Libertazzo is a psychoanalyst. He's a fellow of the American Board and Academy of Psychoanalysis, board certified diplomat of the American Board of Professional Psychology. He's in private practice in Princeton, New Jersey. Those credentials mm-hmm. really aren't of interest. I mean, it helps, but the truth is how he got those credentials and how he got there is what made me think that he would be a great guest for this podcast. So first of all, welcome, Michael. I'd love it if you would tell our guests about your journey before you became Dr. Libertazzo. Sure. I was born to two incredible parents who you know, had their struggles like many of us and our parents have had, but they modeled for me some important things. And one of the central things was their heart and their drive to protect and serve. And I learned this very, very early on by the way they were. And it was toward our family, but it was also toward, and this was central to them, is is to go beyond your biological family. Who else do you serve? I had a, a fairly happy childhood, but I did learn that they used the trauma from their background to evolve into who they were and what they did with their heart. I was a bit of a wild kid, got into trouble. Was education and... focused in your family? Because you know, you have a PhD. My dad was the first one to go to college in his family. He became a public school teacher. And he had great pride in being a public school teacher. I'm a second generation Italian American. Most people in my family in his generation and before either didn't or barely graduated high school. I probably had some serious learning difficulties, but in our blue collar town and way back then, there wasn't something that was really attended. You know, I was an athlete. I, I had a good time in high school. It was really about social life, but I, I really didn't pay attention. And I came from a blue collar family, so I really took all the shop classes. And in my kind of wild days, I decided to get a motorcycle. I was in a terrible motorcycle accident when I was 17, and I actually coded. My grandfather was a couple doors away, and he was told the news that I had died, but they were able to kind of bring me back. I was 17, so I got up and did some more reckless things. And then eventually I got into some more serious trouble. Before got- we talk about that, I want to ask, so you're 17, you're in high school at this time. Yeah, I'm just graduating high school. College was not senior. on the horizon? Not at all. Yeah. Not even, a, you weren't applying, you weren't thinking. What do you do when you graduate? What did you do? <laughs> So early on, I thought I was going to become the heir to my mother's family's Italian restaurant, but they sold it. And all of a sudden, oh, I guess that's not going to happen. So I, with a, with a guy I went to kindergarten with, we jumped on our motorcycles and we went to California. I kind of crashed and burned there. I was homeless for about six months. I actually lived in a church, Our Lady of Malibu. They let me sleep in the church. And then I did some work around the grounds, which gave me enough money to eat. But I was I was homeless and it was tough. And then I, uh, you know, saved up some money, came back to New Jersey, and that's when I got into trouble and ended up meeting my rehab, rehab counselor. And I started having more and more spine issues and hand issues from the motorcycle accident and couldn't work at all anymore. And they they somehow believed in me and said, "Okay, we're going to assess you." And they got me these surgeries and. It was my counselor that said, so what are you going to do now? And he said, what about college? I said, I'm not smart. What do you mean college? I, you know, I thought he was kidding. So I applied to 10 colleges in New Jersey under his guidance, and nobody would take me because my high school was so bad. But Union County College had an open door policy. If you had an equivalency or 
a high school diploma, they took everybody. So I went there and, and this is a concept that um, I'm framing systemic humanity because you'll hear this throughout our talk today that, you know, certainly Michael had a lot to do with this and my background and my parents, but so did the system. Before we talk about that, though, I want to talk to you about your lowest point. You were placed at a commission involuntarily, let's put it that way, for a period of time mm-hmm. based upon some mm-hmm. reckless mm-hmm. actions you took, I mean, incarcerated. Right. Mm-hmm. What was that like? So that was pretty scary. You know, I was really frightened and I, I felt like I didn't belong there. I mean, I came from love and I met a lot of people in jail that were really scary and, you know, they were not given the opportunity. They weren't raised the way I was. And perhaps I needed to see that to kind of wake me up to what am I doing? Were you hopeless? Um, I mean, that's a pretty depressing place to be after high school. Well, my mother was very, very frightened. My father was very, very angry (laughs) at at me. And I wasn't sure whether I was going to make it and where am I going from here? You know, I was I was holding on by a few threads. I was just so frightened and didn't have a direction. You didn't think you were very smart, you said. You didn't think you were college material and you were in physical pain. You, right. You've spoken about there was a very, very, very low point where one person reached out to you and believed in you. The rehabilitation counselor? Yeah. So that was the first. And his suggestion was about college and... From there, more people reached out to me. So I went to County College and I was taking an English class and I had a TA and everybody's taking the class because, you know, it's required. She asks me, why are you here? And I'm kind of like, want to learn and I want to learn how to write. And, you know, I didn't have reading and writing skills. And she's like, oh, who's this guy? And she really took a great interest in me. And so did a couple of other psychology professors. Um, and what what struck me is that so many people seem to really care about me in a way that I hadn't felt before, you know, educators. You know, not that my family didn't care about me, but they didn't they didn't really look into me as deeply as these folks did. So there were two particular psychology professors, and then Wendy, my English teacher, and she said, "What's next is you should go to a four year school." How did you react to that? I'm kind of opening to it, and I got excited about it. I loved learning about psychology and sociology and education and philosophy and comparative religion. And she said, you really, you're the student who should go to Livingston College, which was a campus at Rutgers. And back then, they had no SAT requirement. It was an experiment. And they were taking everybody from inner cities, people like me, people who have very non-traditional background, a lot of kids from Newark, from Jersey City, from Patterson. So I got into Livingston College. I tried doing the SATs, but I did so poorly on them. Like I said, none of the other colleges wanted me. And then again, I met teachers there that took an interest in me. And I actually triple majored. From there, it just kept building. And I started taking graduate classes as an undergraduate in group therapy and got a bachelor's degree in psychology, in sociology, and comparative religion philosophy. So what's fascinating to me is, I mean, I'm sitting here, we're talking, you're a successful psychoanalyst in Princeton, New Jersey, with all the trappings of that. And then you hear this story and it's, it's hard to blend the two, but I I don't know if I would say I'm surprised that people reach out. I'd like to think we have enough humanity to do that, but there's also another component of somebody reaching out. You had to be open and vulnerable to accept that. And, And I'm wondering where that came from. That's a great question. And it's hard for me to kind of really see in myself what they saw in me. The best I can think of is they felt my mother's heart. My mother, like what I say about my mother, she didn't really need to go to church. She just lived love to to anybody. And my dad had an aggression in him, given his background, and he would protect anybody. He would put himself in harm's way. You know, I remember as as a kid several times him screeching the car to a halt 
and jumping out, seeing somebody being abused, and he would literally put himself in between them and and egg the person on, do it to me, and nobody would because he looked like a crazy man. And I was frightened, but I was also incredibly proud of my father. And so my guess is that that people saw the heart of my mom and the drive of my father. But what did you see in yourself that allowed you to be open to them extending their hand to you? I mean, it was a pretty rough road. You know, you weren't the smartest kid, the most academic right. kid. You right. got to a terrible accident. You were homeless. Mm-hmm. You were, mm-hmm. you know, you're incarcerated. What is mm-hmm. it in you that opened your heart to people's extension of their hand? Because many times people just are shut down after that kind of pain. The best I can say to that is I felt the love around me growing up. And by extension, I felt the love in these other people toward me. You know, as my parents taught me, go beyond your biology. And these people were going beyond their biology. They were caring about me. When you finished college, you decided to even pursue further. At that point, did you think being a psychoanalyst is in my future? Or did you just continue to want to learn? At that point, I didn't know what a psychoanalyst was. I I took it and learned each step of the way. So each step of the way, each school, some teachers taught me to go to the next school. And so from there, I went on to a master's with the guidance of one of my undergraduate professors. And then from there, I came back and did the doctorate back at Rutgers. Then I started to learn a little bit more about what's a postdoc, what's a six-year postdoc in psychoanalysis about. And it was, again, from a particular a supervisor of mine who was guiding me and I was kind of open to her suggestions. And here's another piece as, as I got, was getting my doctorate and was going to get, become a licensed psychologist. I get the application and it says on it, have you ever been arrested? <laughs> and I'm like, Oh no, after so all at the this, whole, end of this whole journey, how many years of school was it at this point? Post high school. This, At this point, it was probably about 11, 12 years of school. So you dig out, you go to school, 10, 11 years, you're, you know, you you could see it. You could see the end. You get the actual application to be a license, which was what your goal was at that point, I assume. Yeah, it, it had become that. Yeah. And they say, had you ever been arrested? Did you panic? The first thought I had was I was scared. I was angry. And I, I said to my own analyst, I'm going to lie. And he said, that's you honest. Lie. You can't <laughs> lie. So he, with my permission, spoke to the chairman of my dissertation, who happened to be the president of the licensing board in New Jersey, in Newark. And what were your this chances is, at this point of getting licensed? Not good. Not, not if you have a record. Okay. So... What Duncan did, he did an incredible thing for me, and it's going to choke me up to say this again. He, unbeknownst to me, that as my name came up at the board meeting, he recused himself from being the president and says, I want to be a character witness for Michael Libertazzo. And that's how I got licensed. 40 years later about, it still brings you great, uh, unbelievable emotion. Absolutely. You know, the other thing about Duncan, Duncan is a, an African-American, and he was, I think, the first and maybe only at the time psychoanalytic African-American psychologist in New Jersey. And Duncan and I got really close as I worked very, very close with him. And he brought me into his family when I was working on my dissertation. And he said to me, you know, I've never fully trusted a white person before. And that again. You know, you know, feeling his heart and the heart of his family. And again, I will go back to this concept of systemic humanity about truly living the brotherhood of us loving one another and caring for one another. When you say systemic humanity, talk to me a little bit more about that, because I know you and I have had some talks before this about resilience and recovery and learning from our pain and suffering. How does that tie into your concept or your thoughts about systemic humanity? I don't believe in anybody that says they're self-made. It takes a system. You know, I am not self-made. I mean, Michael had something to do with it, but so much of 
all before me that lived in me and lived through me, you know, to find faith and hope and what lived in all these other folks that came toward me, we did it. I often talk about myself in the third person, and I really observe myself that way because, you know, all these folks were part of what allowed Michael to climb out of the depths of where I was each step of the way and continue to do currently in my life. Did you ever... <laughs> Michael, up until that point, when you finally got licensed, did you ever, ever, through the hardships that you experienced, did you ever lose hope and say, this is just a hopeless situation, I'm never going to dig out or get out? You know, I've had waves of doubt, certainly, thinking I couldn't make it. And again, I kept getting picked up by those around me and supporting me and listening to my pain and my fear and my tears and lending their support and resources. And once again, you know, helping me get what I needed to get over the next hurdle. As you did. So your career, your life goes on. Mm -hmm. And then September 11th happens. And you're a first responder. I'm going to yeah. ask a really simple question. There were lots of us within an hour or two of that tragedy in New York and that horrific day. But you chose to go in, go toward. Why? You weren't a firefighter. You weren't a police officer. You weren't a, a medical in the traditional sense expert. So I, I had worked with police officers. I was a part of an organization that, that is committed to serving police officers in psychotherapy. So I was part of this team. And I called in and said, so what are we doing? Are we assembling there? And the person who was the director at the time, he said, yeah, come on down. I knew I wasn't going to drive there, so I actually hitchhiked. I had a go bag, and I used my credentials, and I got myself all the way into ground zero zone one. How long were um, you there for? How long were you in New York for? I was there 24-7 the first two weeks. And I slept on some cots at Stuyvesant High School. And then some of the New York City residents, you know, New York City was just really incredible at extending themselves and, and, and trying to do whatever they could. So this one family put me up in their house and I lived there with two firemen every night. We'd work our way there and they would have this big spread of a meal for us 24-7 down at Ground Zero. There was any kind of food you would want. Every restaurant just was was doing whatever they could to get their food down there and and clothing and supplies. And you know, it, it was like when you when you would come out and and go to the residence at night, no matter what time of night it was, that you were in a parade. That the streets were just lined with New Yorkers. That you know, give you hope? Was that because I don't know how you could be hopeful in that situation. I mean, candidly, how you could even go to bed, get up and do it all over again. What what motivated you? What gave you the strength to do that? I remember it like it was yesterday, not 22 years ago. <laughs> when I was first walking in the first time, I could feel my heart pounding in my chest. And I have this two canister mask on and this helmet on and I'm walking. And as I'm getting closer to zone one, right to the pile, the ash is getting deeper and deeper. And there's just destruction like you've like you'd never could even imagine everywhere, you know, fire engines and police cars and and building material. And I just kept saying like my mantra became, Michael, it's not about you, it's about them. And then I began to calm. And you know, those first couple of days before it became organized was just a oneness of everybody working together. There were no ranks, there were no divisions, there were no what organization are you with, what federal this or that. It was just in a panic, digging, 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 trying to find survivors. I mean, there were Apache helicopters, you know, 100 feet off the ground coming from behind a building because it wasn't clear whether America was under attack. There were these fighter jets circling just lower Manhattan all night long 
you were just lulled to sleep listening to these jets. You know, fortunately, there was no attack, but there was just an incredible sense of, of community and camaraderie. So what I did the first three or four days was to to be on the pile and to see who's on the the bucket brigade, you know, was done by bucket by bucket, trying to get debris away to dig, you know, tunnels in to try to find survivors and who was injured on the pile and how do I get them off the pile? How do I get them to medical attention? So that's mainly what I did. <clears throat> what was the emotional impact of that? I mean, how do you process that? What was your processing like after you left those weeks of 24-7? <clears throat> so when I got back home to Princeton, <clears throat> I remember the first time I went downtown and I saw these people behind a glass window at a nice restaurant eating in the window. And I was so filled with rage, I came close to putting my fist through the window. And I wanted to say, how can you just sit there and eat? And I knew that I wasn't safe and I had to go home and not, not, not be out in public until I could really calm down because I didn't realize I was so angry. I think that was the grief that was in me, that it was all just happening and it was all just a blur. And it was just so intense. And I didn't know who else to talk with. I talked on the phone quite a bit with a psychiatrist from Bellevue that we had worked close together at Ground Zero. And we became buddies to help each other. And I, I went back and served in some different ways. So I, I actually served on some ferries that were taken over from like, I think it was Jersey City that would take loved ones over so that they could see the site and they had built like this deck and that they could begin to mourn. And there was like a group of flowers and, and different things that they could leave there. And I, I started going back and forth with them and even that was too much for me. So I discontinued that after a few days. So the emotional <laughs> healing, I, mean, I don't know if you ever heal from that or recover, but you certainly mm -hmm. have to process as you've done is one mm -hmm. thing. But then there comes a time where there's another discovery as a result of that time at Ground Zero. They, they created this, what they called the federal, the medical monitoring program for first responders. And it was out, I think it was at Mount Sinai in New York. So I went to see the the director, happened to be the ENT that was going to see me. And he just saw how congested my nasal passage was and how sick some first responders from New Jersey are. So it was the impetus to get a satellite at Yosha at Rutgers. So I began going, because they weren't, you know, they didn't think that all these New Jersey guys were going to make it all the way up to Mount Sinai. They weren't, they just weren't going to get examined. So I started going there and I have a, a really wonderful medical team there. And it was like a couple of years later in, in these incredible testing that they do and these physicals that I was diagnosed with bladder cancer. Rectally related to the time or connected to the time at 9-11. Did you, when you were there or when you were going through that, have <clears> any <throat> awareness that your health could be compromised? Never thought about it. I mean, I after it was over and I started going for the exams, I began to think about it. <laughs> Dr. Shohat said to me, he said, I'm so sorry, Michael, but we don't know what's going to happen to you. You breathed in Formica and plastic, you breathe in all these solids that became a gas, and we don't know what they do to people, but we're going to keep, we're going to do everything we can to try to help you. What did they do and to you? So they have been really wonderful. You know, my doctor, Dr. Udison, went to Congress and testified. John Stewart was, was the celebrity that we needed to kind of really push it. And, and to use his intellect and, and his aggression to get funding. You know, I've, I've been met with just incredible nurses and doctors and surgeons. 
My cancer's come back 16 times. I've had 19 surgeries. The difficult thing with cancer is that if they don't treat it aggressively enough, you die of the cancer. If they treat it aggressively, you have you know, horrendous side effects from the treatments, which is, you know, you know, takes its toll as well. But I am feeling well. I'm in chemotherapy every 28 days now because whenever they stop it, you know, the tumors form. The nice thing about bladder cancer, if there's anything nice about it, is that they can, through a catheter, they can soak my bladder with the, the chemo drugs every 28 days, and that keeps the tumors from forming. So I will do that for the rest of, for as long as I can, so that I can keep my bladder. And it hasn't metastasized anywhere else. They are watching some nodules in my lungs, but so far my pulmonary tests are all good. You know, I feel good. And you're practicing actively, you're working. So wait, cancer 16 times as a direct mm -hmm. result of your work at Ground Zero, 19 mm -hmm. surgeries, and mm -hmm. continuously chemotherapy every 28 days. Correct. Yeah. How did you stay hopeful through that? Because that's certainly heartbreaking. How did you, how do you? It's been year. how many years has this been going on? It's just about 10 years now. And you continue to practice, see patients, be involved. But but how? How do you not lose hope? How do you not get discouraged? Actually, the lawyer that connected you and I, I was coming from a dinner party at her house. And she, at the at the end of the dinner, as I'm getting my coat on, she said, so, you know, Michael, you know, if you knew you were going to get cancer, would you have done it? And I just quickly kind of quipped back at her. And and said, you know, Jane, if I hadn't gone, I wouldn't be me. And that just came flying out of my mouth. You know, it's one of those things. And I am proud of what lives through me, you know, that it's it's way more than Michael. I mean, that's what I want your listeners to get that, you know, there's Michael, the character, the embodiment of this personality. But there's so much that lives through me. And it's, it's through the injuries and the hardship of my life that brought even more to me and nourishes me. And I don't know what I would do with myself if I didn't continue to nourish others. I mean, it's really still really cool to be me. <laughs> but, you know, you nourish others through your practice, through your patience, through your psychoanalysis. And I, I understand that. But this mm -hmm. is a whole nother level of nourishing, of giving back, of absorbing what's happened and becoming you. And in fact, mm -hmm. I know that when COVID happened, for lack of a better word, in March 2020, you, you have a pretty extraordinary story about that too, because, and you were in active treatment for your cancer, but you yes. went in-house, so to speak. In, in March of 2020. Can you tell our listeners about that? Because this, particularly with your history, is, in my opinion, it's an extraordinary act. But tell us about that, if you would, and why. So down here at Penn Medicine at, at Princeton Hospital, the director of religious ministries knows me well, and I know him well. And they were all in a panic that they weren't going to have enough ventilators. And this was in February, March of 2020. And would I come in and do debriefing groups with the physicians and the nurses? The chaplains were all sent out. He was the only chaplain in, in the building. Um, I actually, there was one other, Sam. And fortunately, in the 11th hour, the truckload shows up with more ventilators. Because there's a federal scoring system, there's a state scoring system about how do we decide who gets saved and who doesn't, and then how do we live with it. And I had had some experience with that on, on a federal team that I worked with earlier. So we started trying to do debriefing groups online, and nobody was When you say up. debriefing groups, can you tell us what you mean by that? Debriefing of the medical professionals, correct? Right, right. The nurses and the doctors. So we, we started trying to do it online. Like, again, it wasn't clear how to remain safe and nobody was showing up. You know, everybody was kind of living the trauma. So I said to Matt, you know, Matt, I know you have young children. 
I'm okay if you don't want to do this, but we have to go to them. You know, and that's what I learned at 9-11 that, you know, you have to be trusted. You have to be in the dust with them in order for them to listen to you. So Matt decided, you know, with his courage that he wanted to go with me and they all know and love him. So I was kind of on his coattail. We started rounding on every floor. We spent a lot of time in the ICU and the PACU, the ER. And what was your purpose there, Michael? So our purpose there was to, I mean, the way I envision it and my earlier training with critical incidents is the, the best way I can say it is that once, and this happens to all of us, that once we have a narrative, once we have a story, right? And we're, we're story makers, we're myth makers. And once we put that into memory, it's very hard to edit it later. So it's very important that you have like a psychological first aid to prevent post-traumatic stress. Help, help and, me with that. Give me an example of that. What does that look like, the story? <clears throat> so they, they're living with, you know, 5, 10, 15 people dying a day. They're caring for patients who they never got to talk to. They came in unconscious. They came in ventilated and they're going to die. Very few of them were taken off ventilators in those first few months. So the stress of it and risking their own life and then not being able to see their own families and no families allowed in the hospital as these people are all dying, trying to get there as soon as possible to help them or when the stories were being made about what they were feeling. We made it up as we went along. And what I would first do is I'm I'm, I'm walking through on each of the wards and I would just ask the doctors and the nurses, you know, how's your patient today? And they would barely look over their shoulders and they would say something about it medically. And then, you know, they got used to me coming every day. And then I got to the next question would be, how do you decontaminate when you leave here? And so then they started to tell me a little bit more as I became familiar. And again, I'm with Matt and they all love Matt. so. I can't be all bad. You know, I'm with Matt. <laughs> you know, we became m and Matt and Michael. And so then the third level was, how do you decontaminate emotionally? Let's freeze frame that. Yeah. Before we do that, let's put this in context. How long <clears throat> were you there for? For how long a period of time? So I was there for two and a quarter years. So in the beginning, obviously, before the vaccine and when people were dying in unbelievable numbers. When you ask the question, how do you decontaminate emotionally? That's a very powerful question. Mm -hmm. Were people looking at you like, what? Or, huh? Right. Right. And right. what did you learn? So on the floor, I was starting to get their attention where I could see they wanted to open their heart to me. So, so the next one thing to get in a little closer was to eat with them, to be in the respite rooms and where we could actually drop our masks and see each other. And I, we started talking and asking these kind of questions. And then, you know, one person would break into tears and apologize and say, I'm so sorry for losing it. And I would look them right in the eye and say, I don't accept your apology. And everybody in horror would look over at me like, what is he doing? And I said, because you didn't lose it, you found it. And then many people were crying and then they couldn't help themselves. Then they were hugging one another. You, you were so there for me. You know, you helped me with this patient, with that patient. I couldn't have done it without you. So then we got it. It was in the flow. And, and then they wanted it, you know, and then they looked forward. And so then whenever Matt and I would walk through the hallways, everybody would turn around and want to talk to us. And then they'd want to say, how are you guys doing? <laughs> Do you think there's a need? I mean, I always think there's a need for people to connect. I think we're meant to be connected. I think we're meant to love each other. I think that mm -hmm. community and love is the only thing that distinguishes us from so much else. And for me, it's been my saving grace. But do you think that there was a need, particularly in that situation for that community to connect and break barriers that they not had? Because there's a certain formality to being a physician or a nurse or a, a physician's assistant. Do you think mm -hmm. there was a need for them to break role during that time and be human, be more human, so to speak? 
So, so the difficult thing in healthcare, and one way to think of it is that you you want to remain compassionate. Yeah. You know that these are these are somebody's brother, sister, mother, father, you know, spouse, and and they're hurting and they're alone because their family can't come. So you want to remain compassionate, but you got to keep some clinical distance so you can do your job and still think. And that balance of of oscillating back and forth between compassion and clinical distance and and helping them with that because you know you don't want to become cold and distant and that these are just bodies and i tell you the the phrase that i often used is this is horrific this is extraordinary so again just like 911 in those first days I was privileged to be on these teams and to just live with these extraordinary people showing up, caring for people, strangers, risking their own life. Because they didn't have to. People could have decided, let's, people could have decided to quit, leave, medical leave. That, that's what was so extraordinary about the pandemic. People chose to go into harm's way. I don't know how else to say it. And care for people who are more vulnerable and sick. What do you think it is about the human spirit that results in people showing up when they are in the firing line? Every once in a while, I say something that passes through my lips and say, oh, that was kind of smart. I should use that one again. So, so, so these became phrases just like, you know, horrific and extraordinary. So I, I began to say, so what are nice people like you doing in a place like this? And everybody would laugh and look at me. And then I say, so no, what is it that lives through you that you're here? And then when I would say, what is it that lives between you? And again, more cries, more hugs. But what was it? What is it? Tell me the secret. What is it that lives through people that has them show up day after day, dealing with the most horrific and unimaginable situations, and yet they come the next day, putting their families at risk, putting their health at risk. What is it? The best I know to say to that is, you know, when you look at the incredible selfless love that we all hope for between a mother and a baby and a father and a baby, I, I think it's some derivative of that, of, of love, of we care, we are humane. And that's what I mean by this systemic humanity about how we breed it in one another. We remind one another and, and we gain from one another. I gained so much admiring all these people from all the things we've said so far about starting at County College, about these people caring for me, about you know, 9-11, about the medical monitoring program. I had a, a call yesterday from my case manager from the medical monitoring program, and, and she was going on about you know, how you guys are our heroes. And I said, well, you need to listen to me now. I speak for all the first responders. I think I can say this, that you are are our heroes because you're keeping us alive. You're treating us, you know, and, and how this goes back and forth, back and forth. So that's the best I know about people risking themselves. Some of the most horrific footage I've seen was D Day. Like, would I have had the guts to be on those, you know, amphibian landing things, knowing you're going to get mowed down by machine gun fire on day one, day two, day three, throwing up and finding the courage to to die to try to help the free world remain free? I don't know if I would have. <laughs> it's it's really, I mean, extraordinary. I mean, we, you know, so when you talk about D Day, <laughs> there's something about history and distance and. You know, that, that mm-hmm. you know, you know, it's it's like when you see any tragedy in the world, right? We distance ourselves from it. I mean, there are horrific things going on all over the world. But right here in our backyard, in our area, 9-11 and COVID were, you know, we were face to face with them. So they mm-hmm. feel worse, even though, of course, <clears throat> there are so many more extraordinary situations in the world. But these are ours. And yet... Yeah. The human experience is we show up, we connect. I'm always amazed, I mean, quite frankly, that people do this. And and you 
have done it several times in your life. And you seem to be fueled by it. So there's the egoic character of Michael. And Michael's proud of Michael. And Michael feels grateful for the life that he's getting to live. And once in a while, he says, did you have to make it so hard on yourself in order to get here? (laughs) Did you have to dig such deep holes to climb out of first? (laughs) But then there's the energy, the cortisol, the adrenaline, the the being. and, And I find this in my private practice, you know, when there's a healing moment, when there's an emotional release and catharsis, and you can just feel this is a healing moment. This is a, an incredible act of kindness, you know, on the, on the floors of COVID or the pulling people off the line at 9-11. And I don't know, it just, it just feels like as, as pure as goodness can be because of the danger along with what is protective, nourishing, reparative at the same time as the risk. So when I speak with you, I feel optimistic about us as a human race, about our need for connections, our need for love, our ability to be vulnerable. There's a whole lot of people out there who might say, yeah, well, there's a lot of just pure evil in the world. And that's a naive approach. That's a naive outlook to think that, you know, love will heal all. Because there's a lot of bad things that happen in the world. And I, I wonder how you reconcile your belief in systemic humanity mm-hmm. with so many every day, whether or not it's shootings, whether or not it's crime, whatever it is. How do you reconcile <clears throat> the behavior of people with your belief in systemic humanity? Fair question? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I've become very protective of myself post-cancer. Like, what do I have to do? How do I give this my best you know, fight my best fight here. And I do know that cortisol prohibits cells from repairing cells. I looked very deeply into cellular and molecular biology and couldn't find much on diet for cancer, but found this guy out in Chicago that I follow. And I've become self and cellular preserving. I protect myself from listening to all the badness in the world. So I protect myself, I'm I'm sorry to say, from the news. I protect myself from my friends who need to cathart because they watch the news. I have cancer, leave me alone. And I do that, you know, so I'm not as, you know, politically conscious, but I know my service. I know what I'm here for. And, and this goes to, you know, when we talked a little bit about Viktor Frankl a couple of days ago, that, that man's search for meaning about what is the meaning of your life? And that being one of the four existential pillars of what we need to do in life. And, and so I have been blessed early on to know what my mission was. And so I have no distraction from that. And that's why I just keep doing it again and again. And I just am signing a contract for my my next thing (laughs) as of yesterday. (laughs) So when you talk about cellular preservation, you're talking about the preservation of your your body, your your vessel. Right. Because that's what we are at the end of the day. I mean, you know, that's if we don't have that, (laughs) we can't embody our spirit. Right. 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 So I've gotten very protective about what toxins I let in that aren't necessary, that I'm not really able to do anything. I'm not in a position to do much about it. So I don't want to hear too much about it. But I'm also really busy doing what service I do know how to do. And I am fortunate to have a platform to do it. Um, I eat really, really well. I also have a spiritual meditation, serious practice. You know, each morning I awaken usually around three or four o'clock in the morning. And the first three or four hours, I listen to crystal balls and Zen bowls. And I take a walk. It's one of the things I can still do physically. And I walk at three miles and I, I wear these weights and I am opening and listening to what are the residuals, the toxic residuals in me from Michael, 
from the ego of Michael, you know, the competitive, selfish, narcissistic, whatever, and, and or what did I absorb from yesterday? And then what is my intention for the day? And I do this almost every day of the year, not quite every day, but well over 300 days a year. And that so nourishes me so that I keep going as well as those around me, you know, that I, I get invited to being part of their team. I'm making it up as I go along. I'm trying to figure out this life just like everybody else and what to do with myself. I love the notion, you know, of protecting yourself. You know, the last few years have been challenging, no matter what your politics. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I, I know many people, including myself, have made decisions of just taking in less than we want to. And it feels sort of selfish. I feel, well, I'm not as informed as I should be, or it feels selfish. But the truth Mm -hmm. is, it's necessary to survive. So I play with that semantic of selfish. Tell me. If we slide it over to self-sustaining, cellular preservation, keeping me alive and fit so that I can continue to do my service and love. So selfish has a, a really negative connotation. It's all about me at the expense of you. Well, I'm taking care of me so that I can continue to to do and, and to do service. That's a great way to look at it. Self-sustaining so you could do service. What advice could you give to our audience as to how to embrace and become part of the idea of systemic humanity? Because many times our heart out of shell, our pretense makes us not able to be vulnerable. And vulnerability is strength, but many people don't understand that. So what advice could you give our listeners to be able to not only absorb kindness and humanity, but to give it? One of the things that I do, I do these sound meditations and I I do them with a partner and we go around to different yoga studios. They lend us their studio and we do it to raise money for a dog shelter from the poorest county in the United States, in Georgia. They bring up, I mean, there's so many of these from Texas, from all these poor dogs are on death row. They have no food. So it was very hard to find a dog during COVID because they all got adopted. So just about everybody in the hospital has a dog. <laughs> so, so thinking about one way to get started is, you know, a couple of days a month, where can I donate myself and charity and my energy to help out? And so dog shelters. I mean, if you, you know, go on some of these clearinghouses for volunteer organizations, they so need help. And, you know, start in the mail room and work your way up (laughs) about what to do. And, you know, I had a meditation teacher 30, 40 years ago, Thich Nhat Hanh, who, who just recently died in the last year or two, and two things that were just so remarkable that he said just so sweetly with his little, you know, Vietnamese accent, you know, he would say to me, to us, not just to me, thinking, 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 all day long thinking, not necessary. And then he used, and I'm like, what else is there? Like, I'm, you know, besides thinking and, and the idea of being, and he used this analogy or metaphor of being a tree. And a, and a tree, back to what we're talking about, about the news, sucks in the carbons, tries to get the carbon back where it belongs in the soil, and then breathes out oxygen, love, nourishment. And, and then the other metaphor he used, and we're in this garden, um, and it was just a really beautiful garden, big, big garden. He goes, I want to show you flower. And I'm looking all around. He goes, I want to show you one flower. And that was really about focus and being the filter to the atmosphere for one another. What can I take in? What can I carry? And what can I give off? And so maybe that's helping clean cages at the dog shelter. Maybe it's, you know, socializing the dog so that they're more human friendly when it's adoption day and they're more likely to get adopted. I mean, there's just endless charities just waiting for people to come and bring their hearts. What what comes to mind here is that we often, I think, under 
underlook and underappreciate what what each one of us has to offer others. And, you know, by not appreciating it, we, we may not offer it. And, you know, there, we're, we're big on Einstein in this town, you know, for historic reasons. And, and one of the things that I often quote Einstein on is that he said once that the theory of compounding numbers is one of the most powerful mathematical formulas he had ever come across in terms of what happens to the numbers. So, you know, we know tipping point, right? So having faith that I'm going to give a little, I'm going to give a little, I'm going to give a little more, it doesn't seem like much. It's just like a drop in the bucket. But but keep at it. And when you reach that tipping point, you have more and more effect. And then as you get in the habit of it, this kind of relates to how do you keep going, like what keeps you going, you you embody it. And it's not an effort anymore because you are it. You're not thinking to do it. It's not a strategy, but it might need to start out as an intention. So in neuroscience, they say intention, attention. So what's your intention? Okay, attend it. Okay, get it going, get it going. You know, go to yoga every day, get to the gym, eat better, whatever it might be, you know, play with your shelter puppy and then watch what happens. But have faith that these are just universal principles that work for all of us. They don't just work for those people who wrote the book. They work for all of us. Oh, my, if we could only communicate that to so many, so yeah. many, we'd be in a different place. I am so grateful and appreciative that you've taken the time to be on our show and not only share with our audience your professional commitments and challenges and what you've taken on, but your personal journey is extraordinary. And if that's not the embodiment of heartbreak and hope, I don't know what is. So thank you so very much. Well, you're very welcome. I just wish that that all the people I'm referring to could be all around me and, and take this bow together with me because we did it. I didn't do it. <laughs> and again, to your listeners, think about what you need to do to being vulnerable so that others know that you need help. And also, who right around you needs help, needs your help. Don't miss it. Show up for them. Because it's a fabric, right? We all need one another. Well said. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us today. Don't forget to follow us on your favorite podcast platform. Please give us a five-star rating and leave a review so more people can listen in to Heartbreak and Hope with Pat Barbarito. 